A season of revival lifts the entire church community into a new level, a new realm in God. We see revival as we journey back to becoming what God really intended the church to be, a habitation of God among man, a dwelling place of God's glory among men. This message encourages us to pray for revival and outpouring of God's spirit. This Sunday and next or the 15th, uh, since we are in a season of prayer and we're actually working towards building up towards something uh, that we will talk um, in depth about in January, the latter part of January next year, I want to spend some time just talking to us about revival and stirring up, stirring within us this passion uh, to pray for revival, to seek God for revival. Uh, and uh, you will hear me use these terms interchangeably, revival, visitation, outpouring. And uh, we are using these terms synonymously, uh, not necessarily trying to differentiate them too much. Uh, so you'll, use me, you'll hear me using these terms interchangeably as we uh, talk this morning. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into a detail, get into greater depth uh, when we get into this uh, whole subject of revival uh, in the early part of um, next year. But let's, uh, let's just, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, background and just uh, share a few of my own personal experiences seeing God work in this manner and trying to describe uh, uh, or paint a picture of what we are, we are going after when we say, God, we need revival or we need a visitation. What are we talking about? Um, I remember during my school days, and you probably heard this story often, but bear with me. Uh, in my eighth grade, when I came to know the Lord Jesus, and uh, during that time, uh, a, year, a year later, many of us were baptized with the Holy Spirit, started praying in tongues as, as you know, teenage boys in Bishop Cotton's. Uh, I remember a time, I think it was in my 10th grade, but there was a particular season where in a matter of weeks, there was just a move of God across our campus here. And at least 70 students, and I'm talking about teenagers, those in, you know, 8th, 9th, 10th grade, 11th, 12th grade, 70 of us were just, 70 of us, lives touched, and we were brought in to the kingdom. We got saved. Our lives were changed. Many of us were baptized in the Spirit, praying in tongues. We did not have a pastor at that time. We did not have a leader. We had no person driving this. It was just a few of us students getting together praying. But there was just a move of God. We all started witnessing, all started sharing the gospel. People started just, you know, it was almost like that. every person you spoke to said yes. If you asked them, do you want to receive Christ? It was that easy. It was like even before you finished sharing the gospel, they were ready to receive. And it was just a move of God happening on campus. Now, of course, we did not understand at that time about visitations or revivals or what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to steward a move of God. We had no knowledge of that. There was no leader amongst us, nothing. But when I look back, I see that was a sovereign work of God, a move of the Holy Spirit that brought so many of us into the kingdom. Today, many of us are in different parts of the world, serving God, living for Christ uh, in different positions. And, and, and yet, you know, the, we all, when we meet together, we talk back, we, we talk about those days when God was moving so amazingly in our midst. And, and there was nobody leading us, guiding us. God was just doing it. I remember during my, in my engineering college, in my third year in engineering college, when I, I started a student fellowship on campus in the engineering college. Uh, on, I'm actually not on campus, but in a hotel close to the, uh, the different medical engineering colleges that were there. And every Saturday we used to meet to teach the Bible study. We had a, a, a fellowship going. And uh, another thing that we did was every Sunday morning, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., about six to eight of us would go uh, to what was called the end point. It was a, a hill that we just you know, went down a slope. We would sit on the edge of the hill. You could look way in the distance, the sea. And, uh, and we would get there every Sunday morning, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. About six to eight of us, sometimes 10 of us, uh, engineering college students, medical college students. We would be there every Sunday morning praying and saying, God, touch 
Manipal as a community. Lord, come visit us. Lord, do something powerful. We want to see a move of God taking place here. And we continued that for at least a year. There were times when we were sitting there and it was raining. We would sit there and pray. We made sure we were there praying. Sometimes it was really hot. We are sitting there praying. Saying, God, you have to visit Manipal. And we were a student group. We had no leader, no pastor, nobody. It was completely a student-run group. Uh, and, uh, and, and something began to happen. During my time, in my third year, fourth year of engineering college, during my time, we were so stirred up. And, and we were just a handful of people, 30, 40 young people. And uh, we went out. We went and had a crusade in Udupi. I mean, that was like, you know, a, a stronghold there. We went, we held a crusade in Udup, we rented a hall, preached the gospel, went to Manglo. Uh, some of our musicians, they even produced an album during that time. And we came to Deccan Studios here in Bangalore, we recorded an album. So God was stirring something in us and, and we were just praying, seeking God. I, fourth year I finished, I graduated. In the meantime, I handed it off the leadership of that fellowship to Davis, who was a medical college student. And uh, he took on the leadership. And the following year, God did something so powerful. And remember, this was a completely student-run group. There was no pastor, no you know, Bible college overseer, nothing. It was all just medical engineering college students. But God just moved so suddenly that the following year, what began, what was uh, just a group of 30, 40 young people just exploded into 200 students gathering together every Saturday evening, worshiping God in spirit and truth. Many of them baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking other tongues, just worshiping, serving on fire for Jesus. No leader, no pastor, nobody to say what to do, what not to do. In some ways that's good, you know. Just let God have his way. And that group of 200 some students were so on fire, they went out. They had meetings in Bangalore. They even came to Bangalore. They did some great productions in those days. Uh, amazing, all on fire for God. Many of them today are in so many different parts of the world uh, serving Jesus, still strong in their faith and in serving God. When I heard about those things, I could only look back and say, God, for that year when we were sitting on that hillside praying, we're seeing the fruit of it. Something's happening now. And, and, and just amazing. So many lives touched. Families also began to join that student-run group. And it continued that way for a good number of years. In our own journey as a church, and some of you may uh, have experienced this as part of this, uh, our journey as a church. I remember 2008, when uh, the, year, the word of the Lord for that year was a year of outpouring. We announced that at the beginning of the year, this would be a year of outpouring. We really didn't know what to expect, but we just announced this is a year of outpouring. In January of that year, we began to hear about that Lakeland revival, the outpouring in Lakeland. God TV had it on all, almost every day. And, 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 and so we began to watch that. And uh, we were inspired by that to begin to meet ourselves and pray and seek the Lord. So I remember the first 50, first season of that, 54 days, every evening, Monday to Saturday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., PM we were gathering together, worshiping, praying, and seeking God. 54 days straight. Every evening, we're just praying, seeking God. It would be basically a time of worship, prayer, and then ministry as the Lord led. We never had anything, uh, uh, a specific format. Then we took a break, and then we went another 40 days of seeking God that year. One of the outcomes of that, that year of seeking God and that, those seasons of seeking God, and I look back in, in, our, in our journey as a church, is that that, made, that brought about a shift in our lives as a community, as a church, where we, then, we went into a, a realm where we learned to just seek or learned to just focus on the presence of God. So that nowadays, you know, if we ever had to, you know, we normally allocate maybe 30, 40 minutes of worship. But if something happened and we decided to just go on for two hours, three hours, just worshiping, pursuing God's presence, most of the congregation would stay and pursue God. And we've had that happen many times. Where we've been in meetings where, you know, we normally say 40 minutes worship, then we get into the word. And there have been times when 
that 40 minutes ended up three hours non-stop and people were still there seeking God. I mean, you were still there seeking God, worshiping. It happens. Sometimes that 40 minutes has become an hour and 20 minutes or two hours of just worship. And I believe that shift in the life of our church took place in that year of 2008 when we intentionally set those times aside to just seek God. Today, we value pursuing the presence of God. Amen? But it happened there in 2008. For me, I can see that's when the change happened. And today people are excited when we say, you know, we're going to just pursue God's presence. And it doesn't matter if there's no great preacher, nothing, but just worship, worship, seeking God and let, letting God just have his way. People just flow with it. Amen. So what we want to do is really just stir our hearts up to seek God again for another powerful visitation. So the sermon title of the sermon today and next Sunday, part one, part two, is simply revive us again. Everybody say that. Revive us again. Lord, we want some more of this, this good stuff. We want more of your presence. We want more of your power. We want more of you visiting us. Revive us again. And we just want to set, uh, set some ground here on, on what we're talking about. And in Psalm 85 and verse 6, uh, in, in Psalm 85, the most likely this psalm was written after God's people had returned from their Babylonian captivity. Uh, they'd come back uh, to Jerusalem. They saw the city so desolate, broken down. Spiritually, things were in bad shape. And so the psalmist writes in, in the initial verses of Psalm 85, he describes the condition and then in verse 6, he prays this prayer. He says, Wilt thou not revive us again, O Lord, that your people may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again? God, won't you revive us again? To revive means to bring life back. To bring us up into a place where we ought to be. Bring us back to that. Revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you. The purpose of revival is not just to get us all excited, not just to have all these extended hours of meetings and all that. That's not the purpose. The purpose of revival is to get us once again to celebrate, become passionate about God, to start rejoicing in Him. Amen? Will thou not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That we will just be so excited about God, just passionate about God. Now, just some understanding on what this revival is, or when we use the terms outpouring or visitation of God. Uh, to set some ground in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, the apostle Peter it is preaching this message after the healing of the, of the lame man. And in his message, he makes this statement in Acts 3.19. He tells the people, repent and be converted for the forgiveness of your sins so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent, be converted so that your sins may be forgiven. So having repented, been converted and having our sins forgiven positions us for what? Positions us for times of refreshing that come from the presence of God. That word times is a Greek word which simply means seasons. Multiple seasons, opportune moments of refreshing. And the word refreshing in the Greek simply means reviving to breathe life again. So what I want to impress on our hearts is that as believers we have access to multiple seasons of refreshing that come from the presence of God. Amen? All right, guys. <laughs> I think really needed refreshing, right? So we have access to multiple seasons of refreshing where God comes, breathes life again into us, just reviving us. And this is really an outpouring of his presence upon our lives. And the Bible calls it seasons, meaning a season has a start and an end. So every year we have mango season. Right? It has a start. You see all the mangoes on the road. 
It has an end. The mangoes disappear. Every year. It's a season. So there are seasons of refreshing. We call it outpouring or visitation. There are seasons where, where God's presence is above and beyond the norm. You say God is among us. God is doing something. Uh, one of the writers describes revival as a time when, of God's people being saturated with God. Being saturated with God's presence. It's that happening among a community of believers. But God, God's presence and power is poured out among them. In an, in an unusual manner. Above and beyond what they normally experience. It's called a season of refreshing. A season of God visiting his people. A season when God comes upon his people. You can also look at it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 4. Where Paul writes to the Corinthian church. And many of us are very familiar with this and, and agree with it theologically. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 4 where Paul says, When you are all gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. With my spirit, in that case you're saying, you know, I'm also there. With the power of the Lord Jesus. So when we gather together in the name of Jesus, what else can we expect? The power of the Lord Jesus. You know, as a community, we are supposed to be hosting this. We are supposed to be a people where the power of the Lord Jesus is present. Because we are gathering together in his name. Are you with me? This is what's supposed to be the norm. But you and I realize and we understand experientially that there are times when like, boy, it's no power. We've gathered but can't feel it. Nothing's happening. Sometimes, and this is usual, there is some power. Meaning something's happening. Yes, our hearts are getting stirred. Yes, some prayers are being answered. Yes, some people are receiving a, a, a touch of the Lord. There is some power. But in a season of visitation, in a season of outpouring, in a season of God's moving by His Spirit, there is great power in that community among those people. That's what you see in the book of Acts. Acts it begins with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is this amazing the open heavens as if you will and God is pouring out his spirit God has poured out his spirit Acts chapter 2 what do you see happen Acts chapter 4 and verse 33 the Bible says and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all so what kind of a community was this this was a community where there was great power and there was great grace. Are you with me? That was the early church. God's Holy Spirit was among them. God was moving. This was a season of visitation. And what was evident among them, there was great power and there was great grace in that community among those people. And as a result, Acts chapter 5, I'm just picking up one passage here, Acts 5, 12 to 15, describes to us what happened consequently because of this great power among them. It says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That none of the rest there joined them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So that they brought the sick out of the streets. And laid them on beds and couches. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by. Might fall on some of them. What was happening? Unusual things. God was moving with great power. People were bringing in the sick. And unusual things were happening. I mean, this didn't even happen in the life of Jesus. Peter is walking by. His shadow falls on people who are sick. And they're getting healed. It's unusual. God's doing something here. And so the news spreads. And people from other cities and towns come to Jerusalem. Just to be there where these believers are. These believers were meeting in Solomon's porch. On the back side of the temple. They were all meeting there. And they would come there. Because something was happening there. Great power in that community. Amen? So, in a season of visitation, in a season of revival, in a season of refreshing, what is God doing? He is helping us 
be the kind of people we are normally supposed to be. That we are supposed to be that. That's the kind of community God wants us to be. And uh, it's lifting us up to a new level of glory. It's lifting us up to a new level of experiencing the presence and the power of God. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and you know, when we, when, we look at, when we look at church history, starting with the book of Acts, and we look at revivals throughout history, we're going to cover that in January when we, when we study the history of revivals and what was God doing? What has God done? This is our heritage. This is our past. This is what God has done over and over again all across the world, right here in our own country. God's done amazing. There have been amazing moves of God. And, and we're going to study that in, in January as we look back at the history of revival, start from, starting from the book of Acts. What we see is that every, in every visitation, in every revival, when God was un visiting his people in an unusual manner, when communities of believers were having great power and great grace upon them, there were certain things that always happened amongst them. I just want to enumerate those for us this morning. We will look at them in detail uh, when we begin in, in, the, in January on. We will look at each one of these in detail and, and learn how to pursue them and, and, and so on. But I want to just bring our attention to these things. Here's what, ha what happens in a season of visitation, in a season of revival. And, uh, and number one is this, that there is a great revelation of who God is. When God is moving among his people, among his own... Uh, and this community of believers, suddenly hearts are opened to know and see God for who he is. You know, on all the other normal Sundays, the poor pastor has to perspire to inspire, you know. <laughs> like, man, I'm sweating. I hope they're getting inspired today, you know. And he's got to do his best. And he's got to explore the Hebrew and the Greek to help people understand, you know, Jehovah and Elohim and Yahweh and all of that. And he's trying to help people. This is who God is. Can you see how big God is? And for most people like, mm-hmm. <laughs> They're going to sleep through the sermon or something. But not in a time of visitation. Not in a time of revival. Not in a time when God is moving unusually among his people. Every heart is open up to see who God is. You don't have to tell people God's a holy God. The fear of God grips every heart. There is an awesome awareness that God is an immensely, unlimitedly... Uh, uh, immeasurably holy and we are, are so frail we are so weak in his presence and along with that comes a great a sense of the greatness of God his uh, immeasurable power his might and also his immeasurable love uh, love that he just loves us so much that he's a father to us all of this grips the hearts of people and you don't have to try to force it in it just happens You look at the book of Acts, it says great fear came upon people. That fear is not a morbid fear, but it's this understanding, this awe of God, this God who is amongst us. Just grips the hearts of people. Secondly, during a time of visitation, a time of revival, a time of outpouring, we've, we see throughout history that there is a heightened revelation of spiritual truth and realities. The Bible all of a sudden comes alive. You know, here we have to do series after series, understand who you are in Christ. This is all about marriage and family. And this is all about, you know, <laughs> your authority and this is how you pray. And we go series after series explaining verse by verse and teaching people. Can you get it? Can you get it? Some get it, some don't, you know. And we have to keep repeating it over and over again. And we're doing the normal thing in church, trying to, you know, build people up, bring revelation, understanding the hearts of people. But in a season of revival, Hearts are just open to spiritual truth. Every page begins to jump on you. You begin to call your friend. Hey, I read this. Hey, did you see this? It's revelation time in the hearts of God's people. It just grips everybody. Spiritual truth, heaven and hell. You don't have, people are not arguing. Is there a real heaven? Is there a real hell? The awesomeness of that grips our hearts. God is real. All of this is real. Because God's presence is so strong among his people. He's bringing us up to the level at which we should be normally walking in. In that sense, uh, being gripped with the reality, spiritual uh, realities of spiritual truth. Number three, 
there is an increased passion, fervor and zeal in God's people towards spiritual things. An increased passion. You know, in a season of revival, everybody is on fire. It's not like normal church. You know, normal church, you say, announce prayer meeting. You're, man, if you had 15 people, you can be happy. But in a season of revival, you don't even have to call for prayer. People are praying. Wherever they are meeting, they're meeting in coffee shops, they're meeting at homes, they're, they're praying, they're pursuing God. It's some God is stirring up people. The normal Christian life is lived with passion. When they, they come together in prayer, they get up and read the word of God. They begin to meet together, they fellowship with each other, they help each other out, they share, they give, they, they help meet each other's needs. There is discipleship here happening spontaneously by the move of God's spirit. People are discipling each other. Uh, they are going out and bearing witness. They are unashamed to talk about Jesus. Yeah, we are so glad we belong to Jesus. Come with us to church. And they are going out on missions. You don't have to force people to go. They are going. They are ready to go. Where can we go next? Next, It's a people on fire for God. I have seen it. And when God was moving among us as students... Saturday afternoons, we used to go to the Methodist church. In the morning, I should I cycle down. Morning, 9 o'clock, go get there by 9, take the key. And I didn't tell them what I said. What are you doing? Go and pray. So I didn't tell them to pray in tongues. I may not have got the key. You know? So I said, we're going to pray. So okay, go open the church. And these are boys, kids like us, you know, 15, 16 years old. We'd go to the Methodist church, lock the doors. And we'd spend day, the day praying. Praying, lying, you know, lying around the altar. Uh, some of us lying down the floor. Some of us sitting, just praying in tongues. Say, what are you praying for? I don't know. We just love God. We just love Him so much. We're praying. Nobody told us to do it. Nobody said we are having 21 days of prayer. None of that. There was a fire burning in every heart, wanting to seek God, wanting to hunger for God, wanting more of God. Nobody told us what to do. We just did what came spontaneously: pray, seek God. There's a fire. Nobody told us to go and witness. I would stop people on the street. Those days I had a cycle, so I couldn't go fast. <laughs> Many times the cycle go flat, so I'd be pushing my cycle. If I find somebody else, I'll stop. I used to load my cycle with gospel tracks. I'd give them. Talk to them about Jesus. Nobody pastoring me and telling me you need to do all these things. No, no. There was a fire of God burning in our hearts. I covered, I took responsibility from a whole community. I went and bought good news testaments and every house I dropped the good news Bible. That they need to hear the good news. Did it. Nobody told me to do it. The fire of God was burning. So that's what happens when God is moving sovereignly by his spirit. People are on fire and the normal Christian life is lived with passion. Nobody needs to drive it. Nobody needs to force it. Nobody needs to urge it. People do it. Because they're on fire by the Spirit of God. Amen. Would you like to be part of such a church? <laughs> Number five. There's an increase in supernatural manifestations. Unusual and mighty signs and wonders begin to take place. Unusual things take place. Things that we never expected. Things that we couldn't explain begin to happen. All kinds of things. Miracles happen, the gifts of the Spirit are flowing, every person is just moving. You know, in those days, as kids, we were prophesying over each other. Nobody taught us how to prophesy. We didn't have, you know, weekend school of prophetic ministry and all that. We didn't have all those things. No book, never read a book on the prophetic. But we would have words for each other, we would encourage each other. Just whatever we knew, God was moving. Unusual things happening. Because God's presence and power is so great among his people. You know, somebody gets touched with the spirit, they start crying. The person next to her or him gets touched and they start laughing. It's the same Holy Spirit. One is crying, one is laughing. Just different reactions to what God is doing among his people. God is moving sovereignly. What else do we see in revivals? We see that there is a powerful transformation of society. Above and beyond what is achievable through planned programs. In almost every revival that, that, that was sustained. We see that the, it went beyond the church. I think I missed a point. Number four, sorry. There's an increase in gathering of the unsaved. 
what happens in a revival in a, in a, in a season when God is visiting his people, the unsaved keep coming to church. I mean, they want to get saved. Remember, when the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, it says, Gentiles will come to your place and kings to the brightness of your place. So the glory of God is upon us as a people. What happens? Gentiles come. The unsaved, they want to come. They want to experience. God is doing something. They come. And like I said earlier, salvation, seeing people saved happens so easily. God is moving. God is doing something. Hearts are just being opened to, to, the, to, to, to spiritual things. And as God is moving on a community, he begins to affect the society around it. So that's number, number six. There's the society begins to be transformed. I know normally we all try doing things. You know, we have these programs that are reaching out into society, dealing with all kinds of ills and evils in the society. We, we're doing that normally. And that's good. But in a time when God is moving sovereignly by his spirit, uh, it just begins to affect the society around us powerfully. In some cases in, in the history of revivals, pubs in an entire town were all shut down. All shut down. So God can do it again? Or is Bangalore a little too complex? <laughs> I don't think so. I know the city is big. I know it's huge. I know maybe 11 million people. But it's still a little drop in an ocean before God. I believe God can move so sovereignly in our city that he can begin to touch different aspects of our society and just begin to change them. Evil goes down, righteousness goes up in our city because God is visiting, God's doing something. And lastly, uh, what usually and normally happens in a season of revival is that people, the saints are so equipped, they begin to get out as ministers of God, they get out on missions, uh, they get into church planning, they're spreading the fire of revival. You know, that's, that's what you see in the book of Acts. The first eight chapters describes uh, the, you know, what was happening in Jerusalem. Everything seemed to be contained in Jerusalem. If you wanted something, you came to Jerusalem. But when the persecution arose in chapter 9, uh, what do we see in chapter 8, what do we see? The disciples were scattered. Historically, the estimate is that there may have been 20,000 disciples at that time. And the persecution came. 20,000, um, several of them were scattered out of Jerusalem. And they went through all the neighboring region of Judea, Samaria. And some went past Galilee and way up into Syria and other parts of the, uh, of the neighboring regions. And everywhere they went, they reproduced what they were carrying, what they had in Jerusalem. And it was ordinary disciples. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But these disciples became carriers. We have a record of one of those in Acts 8. When Philip goes to Samaria, what does he do? He doesn't go there and start serving foods. Although that's what he did in Jerusalem. But when he went to Samaria, he, he, he was full of faith and power. He preached the gospel. People got saved and things began to happen. Why? He was a carrier of the fire. He became a carrier of the fire. He became so equipped in Jerusalem. When he had to leave, he was carrying the fire. They spread all across the region. Everywhere. If you look at the history of world missions, the Moravian Revival gave birth to the most number of missionaries in a, in, a, in a short period of 20 years. More missionaries than 200 years prior to them. And it was a small community of 70 odd believers in, in, in a small town of, uh, of, in, in Germany. Small community. But what a move of God. Things happen. Believers are, are, are carry the fire to uh, several different places. So what I want us to understand is that this is what we are asking God for. God, revive us again. Give us a God, a, a come and visit us. Uh, we want your presence and your power more than what we have now. Uh, we want this, oh God. We want another season of revival. And every season of revival lifts us into a new realm in God, a new level of glory. And we have to make our journey from glory to glory. And every time we come into a new level of glory, we're experiencing that. We consolidate it. We just don't drop back in, into the way we were. But we, we consolidate that in our life as a church. Or we, we, we say, this is, where we, uh, this is our new norm. This is how we're going to live life. And, and then we begin to seek God for more. And we move to another realm of glory as we make our journey both individually and as a church. We, we go from glory to glory. God never intends a period of revival uh, to cease and then for people to drop back. Although that's 
kind of what has happened. But we must learn to consolidate that and say, okay, God, we're going to live now at, the, at this new level and we're going to press in for more. Take us, God, to another level in you. And so I like to make this, this statement here that every visitation of God should become a habitation of God and become a move of God released through the church into the community of the world. Can we say that together? Every visitation of God should become a habitation of God and become a move of God released through the church into the community and into the world. So as God visits us, we say, God, now we want this to remain among us. We want this to be an habitation. This wants, we want this to be the new norm at which we walk in. And not only do we want that, but then we want to release it to the world. What God gives to us, if you don't release it out of us, it's going to die with us. But when God gives it to us and we go release it to the world, we are multiplying it and God is just going to keep pouring more into our lives. Amen? That's why it's so important to release what God gives you. Give it away. Go bless the world. Go bless the nation. Give it away. Release it. Because God wants what he gives to us to become a move. To release that fire across our nation. So that was the introduction. <laughs> I want to just bring us to this main point, And I'm not going to be too long on this main point. To call us to a place where we will pray for revival. Pray for this. When you look at church history, there is no telling, there is no formula for revival. It's a work of God. The only thing you and I can do as people is to pray and prepare. We can break the ground, we can till the soil and sow the seed. That's what we can do. But he gives the rain. In the book of Acts, they prayed for 10 days. Then was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. There have been times in church history when a group of women in the, in the, in the Hebrides Islands, they prayed, they prayed for a period of three months and then revival came. There are other accounts where churches prayed for a period of seven years. Then there was a visitation of God. In the layman's revival that, that started off in New York City, again, and there's no telling on how many people should pray. Sometimes a handful of people, sometimes a bigger number. Sometimes it was one man. The layman's prayer movement in, in New York City began with one man. He said, I'm going to pray in the afternoon. And a few people got together with him. They started praying every afternoon, 12 to 1. They would stop and they would pray. And it just the fire of God just began to spread. And it spread all across New York. Hundreds started gathering in different church buildings, praying. There was no promotion, no publicity, no, you know, WhatsApp, Facebook, none of that to, you know, get the word out. Just, and then it spread all across America. A period of two years. People just pausing to pray. Just, just happened. One man wanted to pray. The whole nation was affected. So there is no formula. There is no, we can't manufacture a visitation of God. We can't manufacture this. But what we can do is to prepare and pray for it. And so all I want to ask is, can we pray and say, God, we've got to go up as a church. We've got to go into a new level. We need more of you, God. We want the fire of God. We want every believer to be on fire. We want the book of Acts to be our norm. Amen? We want that. And every revival, it seems like it's just a reproduction or a, a, a replication of the book of Acts to some extent. Just the same thing's happening. God doing it again. And so God, we want to have that in our lives as a community. And we want to impact our city. We want to impact our nation. So I want to bring our attention to Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 7. And I close with a, a few thoughts from this passage here. Isaiah 62, 1 to 7, just a little bit of background. The prophet Isaiah has, has been prophesying to Israel, to Jerusalem, the people there, saying, look, it, judgment is coming. Nebuchadnezzar is coming. Things are going to happen. Uh, God's going to judge this land and this nation. Uh, and, then he, and still he announces about the glory of God. In Isaiah 60, 
He announces, you know, God is saying, Arise, shine, your glory will come, and, and God's glory will be seen on you. So he's pronounced that, but yet he's very aware of impending judgment and destruction is going to come upon Jerusalem. And in the middle, understanding all this, what does he do? Here's his response in Isaiah 62, 1 through 7. He says this, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hepzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And give him no rest, till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now, here's Isaiah, the prophet. He is so stirred up about Zion and Jerusalem. Now, there is a parallel that we can draw because it, Zion and the old Zion and Jerusalem, the Old Testament, is a type of the church in the New Testament. You get that in Hebrews, the twelfth chapter, and also First Peter, chapter two. Now, what is the prophet Isaiah stirred up about? He says, "For Zion's sake and for Jerus Jerusalem's sake." I will not keep quiet. I will give myself no rest. Why? Because I want to see her regain her glory. I want to see her be the kind of nation God has destined her to be. That's his prayer. So until that happens, I'm going to pray. I'm going to keep speaking. So my question, my challenge to you and my, me is this. For the church's sake, he said, for Zion's sake, for Jerusalem's sake. Would you and I say, for the sake of the church, for the sake of God's people, I will not keep silent. I will keep speaking that there are greater realms that we must go to, that there is a greater life that God's called us to live. There is greater glory that's awaiting the church. Will you keep speaking? And he says, I will give myself no rest until I see this happen. Amen? Would you be so passionate about the church? Or, like the prophet Amos said in Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, he said, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Meaning, here are people who are comfortable in church, you know. I sing my three songs. Pastor gives me a good sermon. I actually take my nap. <laughs> and then I say hello to some, by some people and then I go. I'm at ease in Zion. It's really nice, comfortable church. Or will you stir yourself up and say, like Isaiah, for Zion's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, for the sake of God's people, for the sake of the church, I will not stop speaking and saying there are higher levels we have to go into. There's greater glory for the church and I will give myself no rest until I see God raise up a people who walk in what he has for them. Will you do that? Or do you want to be at ease in Zion? And he says, I'm going to do this until, until. Meaning, I'm going to keep doing this until I see. Until this happens. I'm going to press in. I'm going to labor. I'm going to pursue until. And then he concludes by saying, you know, I have set watchmen. Watchmen, don't keep quiet, don't keep silent, give God no rest till. Meaning, he is calling other people and saying, watchmen on the walls. Now, what about the watchmen? Of course, the watchman is uh, responsible for the security of the city. But one very important thing about the watchman, when others are asleep, he's awake. And the watchman has to stir to keep himself up, uh, uh, to keep himself awake. He may want to sleep, he may, 
his body may be crying out for sleep. He may want to lie down and take it easy. But he's got to stir himself up because he's got a mission. So he's saying, God's got some watchmen on Jerusalem. God's got some watchmen in the church. Amen. And they will keep speaking, saying, this is what the church is supposed to be. And they will not rest. And they will give God no rest. Meaning they're going to come before God and say, God, revive us again. God, send us, Lord, the outpouring, the visitation of the Spirit that will lift us up to the realm and the level at which we're supposed to be at. Take us, Lord, to a new level of glory. The call to you and me is, will you be one of those watchmen for the church? Will you stir yourself up and say, I'm going to stand until I see this happen. I want this for my church. Amen? Would you do it? Let's stand to our feet, please. Call our worship team up. This morning, we just want to look to God and say, God, stir us up. Make us a people on fire for you, God. We don't want to be at ease in Zion. We don't want to be just a nice and cozy in the church. But we want to be like the book of Acts where people were on fire for you. They were on fire. They were passionate about the normal Christian life. They were on fire for the word and prayer and fellowship and discipling and witnessing and missions. These people carried the fire of God wherever they went. I know we are in a modern day, in a modern times. Life is different and life is complex. And we've got all kinds of responsibilities and distractions. But yet, God's standard for the church has not changed. God's call for the church has not changed. We are here to be a people of his glory. We are here to impact our world. We are here to let his glory be seen upon us. Could we pray and say, God, until that happens, we will give ourselves no rest and we will not keep silent. Because there is more for us, oh God. There is more for us. There is more. Would you commit yourself to being a watchman for the church? Like the prophet Isaiah, would you say, I will not keep silent and I will give myself no rest and I will give God no rest until, until I see it happen. And Father, this morning we just invite the work of your Holy Spirit just to stir up our hearts. Oh God, ignite a fire in our hearts. Set our hearts ablaze. Bring us out of our ease and bring us out of the place of passion, of fire, burning for you. Holy Spirit, light a fire in every heart. Oh God, this morning. Let's go. 
down to your spirit. Lord, we just cry out to you and say, on all the peoples of the earth, up even now, just begin to stir our hearts up for your truth, for your words, for your presence. Prepare our hearts, every heart, O oh God, of this place, and that we are stirring, saying that greater things are on its way, and that God, you're getting us ready for a great visitation and getting us ready for a great work and a great move of your spirit. Oh God, that will impact our city, Lord, that souls, that people in our city, multitudes, multitudes in our city will be saved and, and brought to that wonderful knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that God will carry the fires of revival, carry the fires of your presence across our city and into our nation, God. Lord, we just don't want to be normal as, as, as we are, but we, we want to be the kind of people the Bible calls us to be, the book of Acts describes us to be. We want to be people on fire for you, people passionate for you. We don't want to be cold and indifferent. And No, Lord, we want to be on fire. Holy Spirit, even now stir our hearts up. And God, we pray you'll begin a, a powerful work, a powerful work stirring us up and causing us to be on fire for Jesus, on fire for the kingdom. Do this, Lord, we pray. Do this, Lord, we pray. Do this, Lord, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
But even now, there's a shift taking place in our lives. And I believe that. I believe that right now, there's a change taking place. And that God's moving us into that place, just being on fire for Jesus. Other things are moving in to a second place. And to be on fire for Jesus is becoming number one. That's what matters. There's a shift. Thank you for it. God, we leave this place on fire for Jesus, ablaze with passion for the King that we love, for the Lord that we love so dearly, that we will not be ashamed of His name, we will not be ashamed of his word, that we will desire for him and his presence. Oh God, we leave this place on fire for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Increase it, increase it, increase it in our lives. We thank you.
And Father, we just pray that you'll prepare us, God, and get us ready just to see these things happen in our city and all across our nation. Give us the joy, the privilege of just being part of this. To see God, you're moving all across our city and all across our land. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. We'll see you again next Sunday. God bless. Have a good afternoon. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.